Welcome back to the channel, Legendary Legacy, Audiobook Free Daily, a channel that shares the audio recap and full audiobook of the legendary best-selling books of all time without spending a penny. Today, we will continue with the book, Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones by James Clear. This is a book that shows you how to make small changes in your habits that can lead to big results in your life. You will learn how to create good habits, break bad ones, and master the tiny behaviors that shape your destiny. We will proceed with Episode 4, The First Law, Make It Obvious, Chapter 4, The Man Who Didn't Look Right, Chapter 5, The Best Way to Start a New Habit, Chapter 6, Motivation is Overrated, Environment Often Matters More, and Chapter 7, The Secret to Self-Control. You can listen to the recap audiobook episodes of the channel, which are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and other podcast platforms. You can search for our channel by typing Legendary Legacy Audiobook Recap into the search bar. New audiobook episodes are published daily and recap books are published on Sundays every week. If you find this content useful, please support our channel by liking, commenting on the video, following, subscribing, and sharing this content with your friends and relatives so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. Episode 4, The First Law, Make It Obvious Chapter 4, The Man Who Didn't Look Right The psychologist Gary Klein once told me a story about a woman who attended a family gathering. She had spent years working as a paramedic and, upon arriving at the event, took one look at her father-in-law and got very concerned. I don't like the way you look, she said. Her father-in-law, who was feeling perfectly fine, jokingly replied, well, I don't like your looks, either. No, she insisted. You need to go to the hospital now. A few hours later, the man was undergoing life-saving surgery after an examination had revealed that he had a blockage to a major artery and was at immediate risk of a heart attack. Without his daughter-in-law's intuition, he could have died. What did the paramedic see? How did she predict his impending heart attack? When major arteries are obstructed, the body focuses on sending blood to critical organs and away from peripheral locations near the surface of the skin. The result is a change in the pattern of distribution of blood in the face. After many years of working with people with heart failure, the woman had unknowingly developed the ability to recognize this pattern on sight. She couldn't explain what it was that she noticed in her father-in-law's face, but she knew something was wrong. Similar stories exist in other fields. For example, military analysts can identify which blip on a radar screen is an enemy missile and and which one is a plane from their own fleet even though they are traveling at the same speed, flying at the same altitude, and look identical on radar in nearly every respect. During the Gulf War, Lieutenant Commander Michael Riley saved an entire battleship when he ordered a missile shot down, despite the fact that it looked exactly like the battleship's own planes on radar. He made the right call, but even his superior officers couldn't explain how he did it. Museum curators have been known to discern the difference between an authentic piece of art and an expertly produced counterfeit even though they can't tell you precisely which details tipped them off. Experienced radiologists can look at a brain scan and predict the area where a stroke will develop before any obvious signs are visible to the untrained eye. I've even heard of hairdressers noticing whether a client is pregnant based only on the feel of her hair. The human brain is a prediction machine. It is continuously taking in your surroundings and analyzing the information it comes across. Whenever you experience something repeatedly, like a paramedic seeing the face of a heart attack patient or a military analyst seeing a missile on a radar screen, your brain begins noticing what is important, sorting through the details and highlighting the relevant cues, and cataloging that information for future use. With enough practice, you can pick up on the cues that predict certain outcomes without consciously thinking about it. Automatically, your brain encodes the lessons learned through experience. 
We can't always explain what it is we are learning, but learning is happening all along the way, and your ability to notice the relevant cues in a given situation is the foundation for every habit you have. We underestimate how much our brains and bodies can do without thinking. You do not tell your hair to grow, your heart to pump, your lungs to breathe, or your stomach to digest. And yet your body handles all this and more on autopilot. You are much more than your conscious self. Consider hunger. How do you know when you're hungry? You don't necessarily have to see a cookie on the counter to realize that it is time to eat. Appetite and hunger are governed non-consciously. Your body has a variety of feedback loops that gradually alert you when it is time to eat again and that track what is going on around you and within you. Cravings can arise thanks to hormones and chemicals circulating. Through your body. Suddenly, you're hungry even though you're not quite sure what tipped you off. This is one of the most surprising insights about our habits. You don't need to be aware of the cue for a habit to begin. You can notice an opportunity and take action without dedicating conscious attention to it. This is what makes habits useful. It's also what makes them dangerous. As habits form, your actions come under the direction of your automatic and non-conscious mind. You fall into old patterns before you realize what's happening. Unless someone points it out, you may not notice that you cover your mouth with your hand whenever you laugh, that you apologize before asking a question, or that you have a habit of finishing other people's sentences. And the more you repeat these patterns, the less likely you become to question what you're doing and why you're doing it. I once heard of a retail clerk who was instructed to cut up empty gift cards after customers had used up the balance on the card. One day, the clerk cashed out a few customers in a row who purchased with gift cards. When the next person walked up, the clerk swiped the customer's actual credit card, picked up the scissors, and then cut it in half, entirely on autopilot, before looking up at the stunned customer and realizing what had just happened. Another woman I came across in my research was a former preschool teacher who had switched to a corporate job. Even though she was now working with adults, her old habits would kick in and she kept asking co-workers if they had washed their hands after going to the bathroom. I also found the story of a man who had spent years working as a lifeguard and would occasionally yell, walk, whenever he saw a child running. Over time, the cues that spark our habits become so common that they are essentially invisible, the treats on the kitchen counter, the remote control next to the couch, the phone in our pocket. Our responses to these cues are so deeply encoded that it may feel like the urge to act comes from nowhere. For this reason, we must begin the process of behavior change with awareness. Before we can effectively build new habits, we need to get a handle on our current ones. This can be more challenging than it sounds because once a habit is firmly rooted in your life, it is mostly non-conscious and automatic. If a habit remains mindless, you can't expect to improve it. As the psychologist Carl Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. The Habit Scorecard The Japanese railway system is regarded as one of the best in the world. If you ever find yourself riding a train in Tokyo, you'll notice that the conductors have a peculiar habit. As each operator runs the train, they proceed through a ritual of pointing at different objects and calling out commands. When the train approaches a signal, the operator will point at it and say, signal is green. As the train pulls into and out of each station, the operator will point at the speedometer and call out the exact speed. When it's time to leave, the operator will point at the timetable and state the time. Out on the platform, other employees are performing similar actions. Before each train departs, staff members will point along the edge of the platform and declare, all clear. Every detail is identified, pointed at, and named aloud, asterisk. This process, known as pointing and calling, is a safety system designed to reduce mistakes. It seems silly, but it works incredibly well. Pointing and calling reduces errors by up to 85% and cuts accidents by 30%.
The MTA subway system in New York City adopted a modified version that is, point only, and, within two years of implementation, incidents of incorrectly berthed subways fell 57%. Pointing and calling is so effective because it raises the level of awareness from a non-conscious habit to a more conscious level. Because the train operators must use their eyes, hands, mouth, and ears, they are more likely to notice problems before something goes wrong. My wife does something similar. Whenever we are preparing to walk out the door for a trip, she verbally calls out the most essential items in her packing list. I've got my keys. I've got my wallet. I've got my glasses. I've got my husband. The more automatic a behavior becomes, the less likely we are to consciously think about it. And when we've done something a thousand times before, we begin to overlook things. We assume that the next time will be just like the last. We're so used to doing what we've always done that we don't stop to question whether it's the right thing to do at all. Many of our failures in performance are largely attributable to a lack of self-awareness. One of our greatest challenges in changing habits is maintaining awareness of what we are actually doing. This helps explain why the consequences of bad habits can sneak up on us. We need a point and call system for our personal lives. That's the origin of the habit scorecard, which is a simple exercise you can use to become more aware of your behavior. To create your own, make a list of your daily habits. Here's a sample of where your list might start. Wake up turn off alarm. Check my phone go to the bathroom. Weigh myself take a shower brush my teeth floss my teeth put on deodorant. Hang up towel to dry get dressed make a cup of tea. And so on. Once you have a full list, look at each behavior and ask yourself, is this a good habit, a bad habit, or a neutral habit? If it is a good habit, write, plus, next to it. If it is a bad habit, write. If it is a neutral habit, write, equal sign. For example, the list above might look like this. Wake up, equal sign, turn off alarm, equal sign. Check my phone, go to the bathroom, equal sign. Weigh myself, plus, take a shower, plus, brush my teeth, plus, floss my teeth, plus, put on deodorant, plus. Hang up towel to dry, equal sign. Get dressed, equal sign, make a cup of tea, plus. The marks you give to a particular habit will depend on your situation and your goals. For someone who is trying to lose weight, eating a bagel with peanut butter every morning might be a bad habit. For someone who is trying to bulk up and add muscle, the same behavior might be a good habit. It all depends on what you're working toward. Scoring your habits can be a bit more complex for another reason as well. The labels, good habit, and bad habit, are slightly inaccurate. There are no good habits or bad habits. There are only effective habits. That is, effective at solving problems. All habits serve you in some way, even the bad ones, which is why you repeat them. For this exercise, categorize your habits by how they will benefit you in the long run. Generally speaking, good habits will have net positive outcomes. Bad habits have net negative outcomes. Smoking a cigarette may reduce stress right now, that's how it's serving you, but it's not a healthy long-term behavior. If you're still having trouble determining how to rate a particular habit, here is a question I like to use, does this behavior help me become the type of person I wish to be? Does this habit cast a vote for or against my desired identity? Habits that reinforce your desired identity are usually good. Habits that conflict with your desired identity are usually bad. As you create your habit scorecard, there is no need to change anything at first. The goal is to simply notice what is actually going on. Observe your thoughts and actions without judgment or internal criticism. Don't blame yourself for your faults. Don't praise yourself for your successes. If you eat a chocolate bar every morning, acknowledge it, almost as if you were watching someone else. Oh, 
how interesting that they would do such a thing. If you binge eat, simply notice that you are eating more calories than you should. If you waste time online, notice that you are spending your life in a way that you do not want to. The first step to changing bad habits is to be on the lookout for them. If you feel like you need extra help, then you can try pointing and calling in your own life. Say out loud the action that you are thinking of taking and what the outcome will be. If you want to cut back on your junk food habit but notice yourself grabbing another cookie, say out loud, I'm about to eat this cookie, but I don't need it. Eating it will cause me to gain weight and hurt my health. Hearing your bad habits spoken aloud makes the consequences seem more real. It adds weight to the action rather than letting yourself mindlessly slip into an old routine. This approach is useful even if you're simply trying to remember a task on your to-do list. Just saying out loud, tomorrow, I need to go to the post office after lunch, increases the odds that you'll actually do it. You're getting yourself to acknowledge the need for action, and that can make all the difference. The process of behavior change always starts with awareness. Strategies like pointing and calling and the habit scorecard are focused on getting you to recognize your habits and acknowledge the cues that trigger them, which makes it possible to respond in a way that benefits you. Chapter Summary 1. With enough practice, your brain will pick up on the cues that predict certain outcomes without consciously thinking about it. 2. Once our habits become automatic, we stop paying attention to what we are doing. 3. The process of behavior change always starts with awareness. You need to be aware of your habits before you can change them. 4. Pointing and calling raises your level of awareness from a non-conscious habit to a more conscious level by verbalizing your actions. 5. The habit scorecard is a simple exercise you can use to become more aware of your behavior. Chapter 5. The best way to start a new habit and in 2001, researchers in Great Britain began working with 248 people to build better exercise habits over the course of two weeks. The subjects were divided into three groups. The first group was the control group. They were simply asked to track how often they exercised. The second group was the motivation group. They were asked not only to track their workouts but also to read some material on the benefits of exercise. The researchers also explained to the group how exercise could reduce the risk of coronary heart disease and improve heart health. Finally, there was the third group. These subjects received the same presentation as the second group, which ensured that they had equal levels of motivation. However, they were also asked to formulate a plan for when and where they would exercise over the following week. Specifically, each member of the third group completed the following sentence. During the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on, day, at, time, in, place. In the first and second groups, 35 to 38 percent of people exercised at least once per week. Interestingly, the motivational presentation given to the second group seemed to have no meaningful impact on behavior. But 91 percent of the third group exercised at least once per week, more than double the normal rate. The sentence they filled out is what researchers refer to as an implementation intention, which is a plan you make beforehand about when and where to act. That is, how you intend to implement a particular habit. The cues that can trigger a habit come in a wide range of forms, the feel of your phone buzzing in your pocket, the smell of chocolate chip cookies, the sound of ambulance sirens, but the two most common cues are time and location. Implementation intentions leverage both of these cues. Broadly speaking, the format for creating an implementation intention is When situation X arises, I will perform response Y. Hundreds of studies have shown that implementation intentions are effective for sticking to our goals, whether it's writing down the exact time and date of when you will get a flu shot or recording the time of your colonoscopy appointment. They increase the odds that people will stick with habits like recycling, studying, going to sleep early, and stopping smoking. 
Researchers have even found that voter turnout increases when people are forced to create implementation intentions by answering questions like, what route are you taking to the polling station? At what time are you planning to go? What bus will get you there? Other successful government programs have prompted citizens to make a clear plan to send taxes in on time or provided directions on when and where to pay late traffic bills. The punchline is clear, people who make a specific plan for when and where they will perform a new habit are more likely to follow through. Too many people try to change their habits without these basic details figured out. We tell ourselves, I'm going to eat healthier, or I'm going to write more, but we never say when and where these habits are going to happen. We leave it up to chance and hope that we will just remember to do it or feel motivated at the right time. An implementation intention sweeps away foggy notions like I want to work out more or I want to be more productive or I should vote and transforms them into a concrete plan of action. Many people think they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. It is not always obvious when and where to take action. Some people spend their entire lives waiting for the time to be right to make an improvement. Once an implementation intention has been set, you don't have to wait for inspiration to strike. Do I write a chapter today or not? Do I meditate this morning or at lunch? When the moment of action occurs, there is no need to make a decision. Simply follow your predetermined plan. The simple way to apply this strategy to your habits is to fill out this sentence. I will, behavior, at, time, in, location. Meditation. I will meditate for one minute at 7 a.m. in my kitchen. Studying. I will study Spanish for 20 minutes at 6 p.m. in my bedroom. Exercise. I will exercise for one hour at 5 p.m. in my local gym. Marriage. I will make my partner a cup of tea at 8 a.m. in the kitchen. If you aren't sure when to start your habit, try the first day of the week, month, or year. People are more likely to take action at those times because hope is usually higher. If we have hope, we have a reason to take action. A fresh start feels motivating. There is another benefit to implementation intentions. Being specific about what you want and how you will achieve it helps you say no to things that derail progress, distract your attention, and pull you off course. We often say yes to little requests because we are not clear enough about what we need to be doing instead. When your dreams are vague, it's easy to rationalize little exceptions all day long and never get around to the specific things you need to do to succeed. Give your habits a time and a space to live in the world. The goal is to make the time and location so obvious that, with enough repetition, you get an urge to do the right thing at the right time, even if you can't say why. As the writer Jason Zweig noted, obviously you're never going to just work out without conscious thought. But like a dog salivating at a bell, maybe you start to get antsy around the time of day you normally work out. There are many ways to use implementation intentions in your life and work. My favorite approach is one I learned from Stanford professor B.J. Fogg and it is a strategy one refer to as habit stacking. Habit stacking a simple plan to overhaul your habits. The French philosopher Denis Diderot lived nearly his entire life in poverty, but that all changed one day in 1765. Diderot's daughter was about to be married and he could not afford to pay for the wedding. Despite his lack of wealth, Diderot was well known for his role as the co-founder and writer of Encyclopédie, one of the most comprehensive encyclopedias of the time. When Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, heard of Diderot's financial troubles, her heart went out to him. She was a book lover and greatly enjoyed his encyclopedia. She offered to buy Diderot's personal library for £1,000, more than $150,000 today. Suddenly, Diderot had money to spare. With his new wealth, he not only paid for the wedding but also acquired a scarlet robe for himself. Diderot's scarlet robe was beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, that he immediately noticed how out of place it seemed when surrounded by his more common possessions. He wrote that there was no more coordination, 
no more unity, no more beauty, between his elegant robe and the rest of his stuff. Diderot soon felt the urge to upgrade his possessions. He replaced his rug with one from Damascus. He decorated his home with expensive sculptures. He bought a mirror to place above the mantel, and a better kitchen table. He tossed aside his old straw chair for a leather one. Like falling dominoes, one purchase led to the next. Diderot's behavior is not uncommon. In fact, the tendency for one purchase to lead to another one has a name, the Diderot effect. The Diderot effect states that obtaining a new possession often creates a spiral of consumption that leads to additional purchases. You can spot this pattern everywhere. You buy a dress and have to get new shoes and earrings to match. You buy a couch and suddenly question the layout of your entire living room. You buy a toy for your child and soon find yourself purchasing all of the accessories that go with it. It's a chain reaction of purchases. Many human behaviors follow this cycle. You often decide what to do next based on what you have just finished doing. Going to the bathroom leads to washing and drying your hands, which reminds you that you need to put the dirty towels in the laundry, so you add laundry. Detergent to the shopping list, and so on. No behavior happens in isolation. Each action becomes a cue that triggers the next behavior. Why is this important? When it comes to building new habits, you can use the connectedness of behavior to your advantage. One of the best ways to build a new habit is to identify a current habit you already do each day and then stack your new behavior on top. This is called habit stacking. Habit stacking is a special form of an implementation intention. Rather than pairing your new habit with a particular time and location, you pair it with a current habit. This method, which was created by B.J. Fogg as part of his Tiny Habits program, can be used to design an obvious cue for nearly any habit. The habit stacking formula is, after, current habit, I will, new habit. For example, Meditation. After I pour my cup of coffee each morning, I will meditate for one minute. Exercise. After I take off my work shoes, I will immediately change into my workout clothes. Gratitude. After I sit down to dinner, I will say one thing I'm grateful for that happened today. Marriage. After I get into bed at night, I will give my partner a kiss. Safety. After I put on my running shoes, I will text a friend or family member where I am running and how long it will take. The key is to tie your desired behavior into something you already do each day. Once you have mastered this basic structure, you can begin to create larger stacks by chaining small habits together. This allows you to take advantage of the natural momentum that comes from one behavior leading into the next, a positive version of the Diderot effect. Your morning routine habit stack might look like this. 1. After I pour my morning cup of coffee, I will meditate for 60 seconds. 2. After I meditate for 60 seconds, I will write my to-do list for the day. 3. After I write my to-do list for the day, I will immediately begin my first task. Or, consider this habit stack in the evening. 1. After I finish eating dinner, I will put my plate directly into the dishwasher. 2. After I put my dishes away, I will immediately wipe down the counter. 3. After I wipe down the counter, I will set out my coffee mug for tomorrow morning. You can also insert new behaviors into the middle of your current routines. For example, you may already have a morning routine that looks like this, wake up make my bed take a shower. Let's say you want to develop the habit of reading more each night. You can expand your habit stack and try something like, wake up, make my bed, place a book on my pillow, take a shower. Now, when you climb into bed each night, a book will be sitting there waiting for you to enjoy. Overall, habit stacking allows you to create a set of simple rules that guide your future behavior. It's like you always have a game plan for which action should come next. 
Once you get comfortable with this approach, you can develop general habit stacks to guide you whenever the situation is appropriate. Exercise When I see a set of stairs, I will take them instead of using the elevator. Social skills When I walk into a party, I will introduce myself to someone I don't know yet. Finances When I want to buy something over $100, I will wait 24 hours before purchasing. Healthy eating When I serve myself a meal, I will always put veggies on my plate first. Minimalism When I buy a new item, I will give something away. One in, one out. Mood When the phone rings, I will take one deep breath and smile before answering. Forgetfulness When I leave a public place, I will check the table and chairs to make sure I don't leave anything behind. No matter how you use this strategy, the secret to creating a successful habit stack is selecting the right cue to kick things off. Unlike an implementation intention, which specifically states the time and location for a given behavior, habit stacking implicitly has the time and location built into it. When and where you choose to insert a habit into your daily routine can make a big difference. If you're trying to add meditation into your morning routine but mornings are chaotic and your kids keep running into the room, then that may be the wrong place and time. Consider when you are most likely to be successful. Don't ask yourself to do a habit when you're likely to be occupied with something else. Your cue should also have the same frequency as your desired habit. If you want to do a habit every day, but you stack it on top of a habit that only happens on Mondays, that's not a good choice. One way to find the right trigger for your habit stack is by brainstorming a list of your current habits. You can use your habit scorecard from the last chapter as a starting point. Alternatively, you can create a list with two columns. In the first column, write down the habits you do each day without fail. For example, get out of bed, take a shower, brush your teeth, Get dressed. Brew a cup of coffee. Eat breakfast. Take the kids to school. Start the work day. Eat lunch. End the work day. Change out of work clothes. Sit down for dinner. Turn off the lights. Get into bed. Your list can be much longer, but you get the idea. In the second column, write down all of the things that happen to you each day without fail. For example, The sun rises. You get a text message. The song you are listening to ends. The sun sets. Armed with these two lists, you can begin searching for the best place to layer your new habit into your lifestyle. Habit stacking works best when the cue is highly specific and immediately actionable. Many people select cues that are too vague. I made this mistake myself. When I wanted to start a push-up habit, my habit stack was, when I take a break for lunch, I will do 10 push-ups. At first glance, this sounded reasonable. But soon, I realized the trigger was unclear. Would I do my push-ups before I ate lunch? After I ate lunch? Where would I do them? After a few inconsistent days, I changed my habit stack to, when I close my laptop for lunch, I will do 10 push-ups next to my desk. Ambiguity gone. Habits like read more or eat better are worthy causes, but these goals do not provide instruction on how and when to act. Be specific and clear, after I close the door. After I brush my teeth. After I sit down at the table. The specificity is important. The more tightly bound your new habit is to a specific cue, the better the odds are that you will notice when the time comes to act. The first law of behavior change is to make it obvious. Strategies like implementation intentions and habit stacking are among the most practical ways to create obvious cues for your habits and design a clear plan for when and where to take action. Chapter Summary 1. The first law of behavior change is make it obvious. 2. 
the two most common cues are time and location. 3. Creating an implementation intention is a strategy you can use to pair a new habit with a specific time and location. 4. The implementation intention formula is, I will, behavior, at, time, in, location. 5. Habit stacking is a strategy you can use to pair a new habit with a current habit. 6. The habit stacking formula is, after, current habit, I will, new habit. Chapter 6. Motivation is overrated, environment often matters more. And Thorndike, a primary care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, had a crazy idea. She believed she could improve the eating habits of thousands of hospital staff and visitors without changing their willpower or motivation in the slightest way. In fact, she didn't plan on talking to them at all. Thorndike and her colleagues designed a six-month study to alter the choice architecture of the hospital cafeteria. They started by changing how drinks were arranged in the room. Originally, the refrigerators located next to the cash registers in the cafeteria were filled with only soda. The researchers added water as an option to each one. Additionally, they placed baskets of bottled water next to the food stations throughout the room. Soda was still in the primary refrigerators, but water was now available at all drink locations. Over the next three months, the number of soda sales at the hospital dropped by 11.4%. Meanwhile, sales of bottled water increased by 25.8%. They made similar adjustments, and saw similar results, with the food in the cafeteria. Nobody had said a word to anyone eating there. People often choose products not because of what they are, but because of where they are. If I walk into the kitchen and see a plate of cookies on the counter, I'll pick up half a dozen and start eating, even if I hadn't been thinking about them beforehand and didn't necessarily feel hungry. If the communal table at the office is always filled with donuts and bagels, it's going to be hard not to grab one every now and then. Your habits change depending on the room you are in and the cues in front of you. Environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. Despite our unique personalities, certain behaviors tend to arise again and again under certain environmental conditions. In church, people tend to talk in whispers. On a dark street, people act wary and guarded. In this way, the most common form of change is not internal, but external, we are changed by the world around us. Every habit is context-dependent. In 1936, psychologist Kurt Lewin wrote a simple equation that makes a powerful statement, behavior is a function of the person in their environment, or B equals F, P, E. It didn't take long for Lewin's equation to be tested in business. In 1952, the economist Hawkins Stern described a phenomenon he called suggestion impulse buying, which is triggered when a shopper sees a product for the first time and visualizes a need for it. In other words, customers will occasionally buy products not because they want them but because of how they are presented to them. For example, items at eye level tend to be purchased more than those down near the floor. For this reason, you'll find expensive brand names featured in easy-to-reach locations on store shelves because they drive the most profit, while cheaper alternatives are tucked away in harder-to-reach spots. The same goes for end caps, which are the units at the end of aisles. End caps are money-making machines for retailers because they are obvious locations that encounter a lot of foot traffic. For example, 45% of Coca-Cola sales come specifically from end-of-the-aisle racks. The more obviously available a product or service is, the more likely you are to try it. People drink Bud Light because it is in every bar and visit Starbucks because it is on every corner. We like to think that we are in control. If we choose water over soda, we assume it is because we wanted to do so. The truth, however, is that many of the actions we take each day are shaped not by purposeful drive and choice but by the most obvious option. Every living being has its own methods for sensing and understanding the world. Eagles have remarkable long-distance vision. 
Snakes can smell by tasting the air with their highly sensitive tongues. Sharks can detect small amounts of electricity and vibrations in the water caused by nearby fish. Even bacteria have chemoreceptors, tiny sensory cells that allow them to detect toxic chemicals in their environment. In humans, perception is directed by the sensory nervous system. We perceive the world through sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. But we also have other ways of sensing stimuli. Some are conscious, but many are non-conscious. For instance, you can notice when the temperature drops before a storm, or when the pain in your gut rises during a stomachache, or when you fall off balance while walking on rocky ground. Receptors in your body pick up on a wide range of internal stimuli, such as the amount of salt in your blood or the need to drink when thirsty. The most powerful of all human sensory abilities, however, is vision. The human body has about 11 million sensory receptors. Approximately 10 million of those are dedicated to sight. Some experts estimate that half of the brain's resources are used on vision. Given that we are more dependent on vision than on any other sense, it should come as no surprise that visual cues are the greatest catalyst of our behavior. For this reason, a small change in what you see can lead to a big shift in what you do. As a result, you can imagine how important it is to live and work in environments that are filled with productive cues and devoid of unproductive ones. Thankfully, there is good news in this respect. You don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can also be the architect of it. How to design your environment for success. During the energy crisis and oil embargo of the 1970s, Dutch researchers began to pay close attention to the country's energy usage. In one suburb near Amsterdam, they found that some homeowners used 30% less energy than their neighbors, despite the homes being of similar size and getting electricity for the same price. It turned out the houses in this neighborhood were nearly identical except for one feature, the location of the electrical meter. Some had one in the basement. Others had the electrical meter upstairs in the main hallway. As you may guess, the homes with the meters located in the main hallway used less electricity. When their energy use was obvious and easy to track, people changed their behavior. Every habit is initiated by a cue, and we are more likely to notice cues that stand out. Unfortunately, the environments where we live and work often make it easy not to do certain actions because there is no obvious cue to trigger the behavior. It's easy not to practice the guitar when it's tucked away in the closet. It's easy not to read a book when the bookshelf is in the corner of the guest room. It's easy not to take your vitamins when they are out of sight in the pantry. When the cues that spark a habit are subtle or hidden, they are easy to ignore. By comparison, creating obvious visual cues can draw your attention toward a desired habit. In the early 1990s, the cleaning staff at Skip Hall Airport in Amsterdam installed a small sticker that looked like a fly near the center of each urinal. Apparently, when men stepped up to the urinals, they aimed for what they thought was a bug. The stickers improved their aim and significantly reduced spillage around the urinals. Further analysis determined that the stickers cut bathroom cleaning costs by 8% per year. I've experienced the power of obvious cues in my own life. I used to buy apples from the store, put them in the crisper in the bottom of the refrigerator, and forget all about them. By the time I remembered, the apples would have gone bad. I never saw them, so I never ate them. Eventually, I took my own advice and redesigned my environment. I bought a large display bowl and placed it in the middle of the kitchen counter. The next time I bought apples, that was where they went, out in the open where I could see them. Almost like magic, I began eating a few apples each day simply because they were obvious rather than out of sight. Here are a few ways you can redesign your environment and make the cues for your preferred habits more obvious. If you want to remember to take your medication each night, put your pill bottle directly next to the faucet on the bathroom counter. If you want to practice guitar more frequently, place your guitar stand in the middle of the living room. 
If you want to remember to send more thank you notes, keep a stack of stationery on your desk. If you want to drink more water, fill up a few water bottles each morning and place them in common locations around the house. If you want to make a habit a big part of your life, make the queue a big part of your environment. The most persistent behaviors usually have multiple cues. Consider how many different ways a smoker could be prompted to pull out a cigarette, driving in the car, seeing a friend smoke, feeling stressed at work, and so on. The same strategy can be employed for good habits. By sprinkling triggers throughout your surroundings, you increase the odds that you'll think about your habit throughout the day. Make sure the best choice is the most obvious one. Making a better decision is easy and natural when the cues for good habits are right in front of you. Environment design is powerful not only because it influences how we engage with the world but also because we rarely do it. Most people live in a world others have created for them. But you can alter the spaces where you live and work to increase your exposure to positive cues and reduce your exposure to negative ones. Environment design allows you to take back control and become the architect of your life. Be the designer of your world and not merely the consumer of it. The context is the cue. The cues that trigger a habit can start out very specific, but over time your habits become associated not with a single trigger but with the entire context surrounding the behavior. For example, Many people drink more in social situations than they would ever drink alone. The trigger is rarely a single cue, but rather the whole situation, watching your friends order drinks, hearing the music at the bar, seeing the beers on tap. We mentally assign our habits to the locations in which they occur, the home, the office, the gym. Each location develops a connection to certain habits and routines. You establish a particular relationship with the objects on your desk, the items on your kitchen counter, the things in your bedroom. Our behavior is not defined by the objects in the environment but by our relationship to them. In fact, this is a useful way to think about the influence of the environment on your behavior. Stop thinking about your environment as filled with objects. Start thinking about it as filled with relationships. Think in terms of how you interact with the spaces around you. For one person, her couch is the place where she reads for an hour each night. For someone else, the couch is where he watches television and eats a bowl of ice cream after work. Different people can have different memories, and thus different habits, associated with the same place. The good news. You can train yourself to link a particular habit with a particular context. In one study, scientists instructed insomniacs to get into bed only when they were tired. If they couldn't fall asleep, they were told to sit in a different room until they became sleepy. Over time, subjects began to associate the context of their bed with the action of sleeping, and it became easier to quickly fall asleep when they climbed in bed. Their brains learned that sleeping, not browsing on their phones, not watching television, not staring at the clock, was the only action that happened in that room. The power of context also reveals an important strategy, habits can be easier to change in a new environment. It helps to escape the subtle triggers and cues that nudge you toward your current habits. Go to a new place, a different coffee shop, a bench in the park, a corner of your room you seldom use, and create a new routine there. It is easier to associate a new habit with a new context than to build a new habit in the face of competing cues. It can be difficult to go to bed early if you watch television in your bedroom each night. It can be hard to study in the living room without getting distracted if that's where you always play video games. But when you step outside your normal environment, you leave your behavioral biases behind. You aren't battling old environmental cues, which allows new habits to form without interruption. Want to think more creatively? Move to a bigger room, a rooftop patio, or a building with expansive architecture. Take a break from the space where you do your daily work, which is also linked to your current thought patterns. Trying to eat healthier. It is likely that you shop on autopilot at your regular supermarket. 
Try a new grocery store. You may find it easier to avoid unhealthy food when your brain doesn't automatically know where it is located in the store. When you can't manage to get to an entirely new environment, redefine or rearrange your current one. Create a separate space for work, study, exercise, entertainment, and cooking. The mantra I find useful is, one space, one use. When I started my career as an entrepreneur, I would often work from my couch or at the kitchen table. In the evenings, I found it very difficult to stop working. There was no clear division between the end of work time and the beginning of personal time. Was the kitchen table my office or the space where I ate meals? Was the couch where I relaxed or where I sent emails? Everything happened in the same place. A few years later, I could finally afford to move to a home with a separate room for my office. Suddenly, work was something that happened, in here, and personal life was something that happened, out there. It was easier for me to turn off the professional side of my brain when there was a clear dividing line between work life and home life. Each room had one primary use. The kitchen was for cooking. The office was for working. Whenever possible, avoid mixing the context of one habit with another. When you start mixing contexts, you'll start mixing habits, and the easier ones will usually win out. This is one reason why the versatility of modern technology is both a strength and a weakness. You can use your phone for all sorts of tasks, which makes it a powerful device. But when you can use your phone to do nearly anything, it becomes hard to associate it with one task. You want to be productive, but you're also conditioned to browse social media, check email, and play video games whenever you open your phone. It's a mishmash of cues. You may be thinking, you don't understand. I live in New York City. My apartment is the size of a smartphone. I need each room to play multiple roles. Fair enough. If your space is limited, divide your room into activity zones, a chair for reading, a desk for writing, a table for eating. You can do the same with your digital spaces. I know a writer who uses his computer only for writing, his tablet only for reading, and his phone only for social media and texting. Every habit should have a home. If you can manage to stick with this strategy, each context will become associated with a particular habit and mode of thought. Habits thrive under predictable circumstances like these. Focus comes automatically when you are sitting at your work desk. Relaxation is easier when you are in a space. Designed for that purpose. Sleep comes quickly when it is the only thing that happens in your bedroom. If you want behaviors that are stable and predictable, you need an environment that is stable and predictable. A stable environment where everything has a place and a purpose is an environment where habits can easily form. Chapter Summary 1, Small Changes in Context Can Lead to Large Changes in Behavior Over Time. 2, Every Habit is Initiated by a Cue. We are more likely to notice cues that stand out. 3, Make the cues of good habits obvious in your environment. 4, Gradually, your habits become associated not with a single trigger but with the entire context surrounding the behavior. The context becomes the cue. 5. It is easier to build new habits in a new environment because you are not fighting against old cues. Chapter 7, The Secret to Self-Control In 1971, as the Vietnam War was heading into its 16th year, Congressman Robert Steele from Connecticut and Morgan Murphy from Illinois made a discovery that stunned the American public. While visiting the troops, they had learned that over 15% of U.S. soldiers stationed there were heroin addicts. Follow-up research revealed that 35% of service members in Vietnam had tried heroin and as many as 20% were addicted, the problem was even worse than they had initially thought. The discovery led to a flurry of activity in Washington, including the creation of the Special Action Office of Drug Abuse Prevention under President Nixon to promote prevention and rehabilitation and to track addicted service members when they returned home. Lee Robbins was one of the researchers in charge. 
In a finding that completely upended the accepted beliefs about addiction, Robbins found that when soldiers who had been heroin users returned home, only 5% of them became re-addicted within a year, and just 12% relapsed within three years. In other words, approximately 9 out of 10 soldiers who used heroin in Vietnam eliminated their addiction nearly overnight. This finding contradicted the prevailing view at the time, which considered heroin addiction to be a permanent and irreversible condition. Instead, Robbins revealed that addictions could spontaneously dissolve if there was a radical change in the environment. In Vietnam, soldiers spent all day surrounded by cues triggering heroin use, it was easy to access, they were engulfed by the constant stress of war, they built friendships with fellow soldiers who were also heroin users, and they were thousands of miles from home. Once a soldier returned to the United States, though, he found himself in an environment devoid of those triggers. When the context changed, so did the habit. Compare this situation to that of a typical drug user. Someone becomes addicted at home or with friends, goes to a clinic to get clean, which is devoid of all the environmental stimuli that prompt their habit, then returns to their old neighborhood with all of their previous cues that caused them to get addicted in the first place. It's no wonder that usually you see numbers that are the exact opposite of those in the Vietnam study. Typically, 90% of heroin users become re-addicted once they return home from rehab. The Vietnam studies ran counter to many of our cultural beliefs about bad habits because it challenged the conventional association of unhealthy behavior as a moral weakness. If you're overweight, a smoker, or an addict, You've been told your entire life that it is because you lack self-control, maybe even that you're a bad person. The idea that a little bit of discipline would solve all our problems is deeply embedded in our culture. Recent research, however, shows something different. When scientists analyze people who appear to have tremendous self-control, it turns out those individuals aren't all that different from those who are struggling. Instead, disciplined people are better at structuring their lives in a way that does not require heroic willpower and self-control. In other words, they spend less time in tempting situations. The people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. It's easier to practice self-restraint when you don't have to use it very often. So, yes, perseverance, grit, and willpower are essential to success, but the way to improve these qualities is not by wishing you were a more disciplined person, but by creating a more disciplined environment. This counterintuitive idea makes even more sense once you understand what happens when a habit is formed in the brain. A habit that has been encoded in the mind is ready to be used whenever the relevant situation arises. When Patty Olwell, a therapist from Austin, Texas, started smoking, she would often light up while riding horses with a friend. Eventually, she quit smoking and avoided it for years. She had also stopped riding. Decades later, she hopped on a horse. Again and found herself craving a cigarette for the first time in forever. The cues were still internalized, she just hadn't been exposed to them in a long time. Once a habit has been encoded, the urge to act follows whenever the environmental cues reappear. This is one reason behavior change techniques can backfire. Shaming obese people with weight loss presentations can make them feel stressed, and as a result many people return to their favorite coping strategy, overeating. Showing pictures of blackened lungs to smokers leads to higher levels of anxiety, which drives many people to reach for a cigarette. If you're not careful about cues, you can cause the very behavior you want to stop. Bad habits are autocatalytic, the process feeds itself. They foster the feelings they try to numb. You feel bad, so you eat junk food. Because you eat junk food, you feel bad. Watching television makes you feel sluggish, so you watch more television because you don't have the energy to do anything else. Worrying about your health makes you feel anxious, which causes you to smoke to ease your anxiety, which makes your health even worse and soon you're feeling more anxious. It's a downward spiral, a runaway train of bad habits. Researchers refer to this phenomenon as Q-induced wanting, 
an external trigger causes a compulsive craving to repeat a bad habit. Once you notice something, you begin to want it. This process is happening all the time, often without us realizing it. Scientists have found that showing addicts a picture of cocaine for just 33 milliseconds stimulates the reward pathway in the brain and sparks desire. This speed is too fast for the brain to consciously register, the addicts couldn't even tell you what they had seen, but they craved the drug all the same. Here's the punchline, you can break a habit, but you're unlikely to forget it. Once the mental grooves of habit have been carved into your brain, they are nearly impossible to remove entirely, even if they go unused for quite a while. And that means that simply resisting temptation is an ineffective strategy. It is hard to maintain a Zen attitude in a life filled with interruptions. It takes too much energy. In the short run, you can choose to overpower temptation. In the long run, we become a product of the environment that we live in. To put it bluntly, I have never seen someone consistently stick to positive habits in a negative environment. A more reliable approach is to cut bad habits off at the source. One of the most practical ways to eliminate a bad habit is to reduce exposure to the cue that causes it. If you can't seem to get any work done, leave your phone in another room for a few hours. If you're continually feeling like you're not enough, stop following social media accounts that trigger jealousy and envy. If you're wasting too much time watching television, move the TV out of the bedroom. If you're spending too much money on electronics, quit reading reviews of the latest tech gear. If you're playing too many video games, unplug the console and put it in a closet after each use. This practice is an inversion of the first law of behavior change. Rather than make it obvious, you can make it invisible. I'm often surprised by how effective simple changes like these can be. Remove a single cue and the entire habit often fades away. Self-control is a short-term strategy, not a long-term one. You may be able to resist temptation once or twice, but it's unlikely you can muster the willpower to override your desires every time. Instead of summoning a new dose of willpower whenever you want to do the right thing, your energy would be better spent optimizing your environment. This is the secret to self-control. Make the cues of your good habits obvious and the cues of your bad habits invisible. Chapter Summary 1. The inversion of the first law of behavior change is make it invisible. 2. Once a habit is formed, it is unlikely to be forgotten. 3. People with high self-control tend to spend less time in tempting situations. It's easier to avoid temptation than resist it. 4. One of the most practical ways to eliminate a bad habit is to reduce exposure to the cue that causes it. 5. Self-control is a short-term strategy, not a long-term one.